Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, hi everyone, thanks a lot for coming. I'm Madan Musuwati from the Research and Software Engineering Group and it's my pleasure to invite Nishan Sinha here today. He is a research staff member at uh, NEC Labs. He works on uh, analysis and verification of both uh, sequential and concurrent programs and hardware and software. And so he's a dude who does everything. And uh, so um, he was joking that if he got a chance to introduce himself, he'll be he'll make it a lot more funnier than I do, and I think that's in a way true. And he has made it funnier already. So okay. It's good. <laughs> so anyway, so Nishat. Thank you. Thank you. I, I guess you can hear me. Okay. So this work is uh, about. Um, analysis of concurrent program, static analysis of concurrent program. And uh, it was uh, FSC last year. Uh, that's where it was presented. And so, sorry, what was Foundation of Software Engineering. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so if you start off with you know, the meaning of staged, look up that uh, there are you know, three different interpretations. And I can assure you it's not the first or the second one. It's more of like the third one, although you know, the first could be future work, you know. Okay. More than the Bollywood style, yeah. Okay. So now we come to the we all know concurrent program verification is extremely hard. There are a large number of interleavings which have to be analyzed and that is the root of the problem. If you look at the history of analysis, you know, the the, the work could all the works could be broadly classified into two approaches, static analysis, dynamic or runtime analysis. Static analysis where you actually take the code and you analyze it using mathematical methods. A dynamic analysis where you run the code and you monitor it or do a prediction based on the currently observed execution. And there have been a, you know, a huge amount of work and huge, large number of tools developed in both these paradigms. Uh, Nishant, I'm surprised you list JPF under static analysis. Why is that? It's, the JPF is, a, again, a very complex tool, but it has all kinds of things under it. But I think the, it started off as a static analysis engine. I, uh, yeah, if you call spin static analysis, I would. Spin, uh, I would call static yeah, so because instrumentation and then the the verifier itself is embedded. I think the initial J JFF was like that. Uh, th that's what. It, but yeah, it could fall in both the thing. Okay, so the the broad uh, set of properties uh, that we are interested in: uh, data races, deadlocks, and more complicated assertion violations. Okay, so. So this particular work that I'm talk, going to talk about is uh, static analysis. Uh, our goal is, as opposed to you know, just testing which analyzes the code for one particular input, we want to analyze all the possible inputs, and all the possible schedules, and simultaneously. So that is what a symbolic method uh, allows you to do. Okay? And our goal is to find bugs. Uh, we'll also find absence of bugs, but they may not hold because of some limitation. But so our main focus is to find bugs. And uh, why we are doing this, there's a huge literature, and why are you making another static analysis technique? Uh, so there are two main bottlenecks of almost all the previous analysis techniques that we wanted to address. Okay, and I'll, uh, before I go to the bottleneck, let me uh, just briefly summarize the tools uh, I, I, I'm going to use in this uh, work. Most of you might be very familiar with with all of the three. So symbolic execution, uh, basically you analyze the parts of the program symbolically. You start with some symbolic inputs and compute verification conditions for the error locations. And you get a formula which you check with a solver. Okay, And that if the formula is satisfiable, then that error location can be reached for some particular input. So it essentially is an enumerative technique where you analyze path one by one. Data flow analysis is, is more of a is a technique which respects the program structure. So you, you, wherever there are joins, for example, due to conditional, you merge the data facts as opposed to analyzing paths separately. You compute function summaries, which, which collapse the facts that you, you compute the facts for each function separately and reuse them. Okay? 
So these two are symbolic execution is more path, more enumerative kind. You explore paths one by one, whereas data flow analysis you merge facts. And the technique that I am going to present will will kind of combine both of these two. Okay, and at, at the bottom uh, of of uh, the bigger picture is take a program with some pro possible error errors or error locations and f and translate into a formula such that if the formula is satisfiable then there is a witness to the error location okay that is the overall paradigm that has been there for like 10 years now and our work is also following that paradigm and the underlying engines that help you do that check the formula are these satisfiability modulo theory solvers which given a program constraint tell you whether it's satisfiable or not give it a, give a model uh, give you back a model or a proof okay so these are the three underlying techniques, you'll see how these three are, are used. Okay, so now coming back to the two main drawbacks. Okay, so the first one is, is bimodal, what I call bimodal reasoning. Okay, so, so these are two threads, T1 and T2. Okay, and a typical analysis, uh, what, what, what it would do is, is uh, you know, execute x equal to three, this right, switch T2, propagate the read, the right, through through T2, uh, that, that is what I call intra-thread reasoning. So it does an intra-thread reasoning, and then intra-thread reasoning does this right, and then again propagate it back to the other thread with intra-thread reasoning. Okay, so it shifts between intra and intra-thread reasoning uh, several times. Problem is that you know if you observe this part, uh, once the value of x is read here, the, all the local facts can, could be computed just once. Okay, so, so the problem is that for every interleaving, these local facts are recomputed. Okay, so I, I'll get to a better example. This I'm just motivating it. Okay, that's the first. You you do repeated intra-thread reasoning for all possible interleavings. Okay, the other one is is perhaps uh, difficult to believe that it's it's a bottleneck. You you perhaps it's difficult to imagine a, a concurrent program analysis without a scheduler. But problem with the scheduler is that it it doesn't model the data flow directly. It, it, it is an indirect way of reasoning about data flow. Okay, so I'll come to both these one by one. Okay, so first example, again, this is a more complicated example, but I'll try to uh, illustrate what are the underlying facts. Okay, so there are two threads, the shared variables X and Zs. Okay, and these A1, A0, A1, A100 are all local variables. Okay, there are some assertions. Okay, and now if you observe, uh, once the value of x is read here, it's copied to a1, and a2, a99, a100, each of them are incremented by one. Okay, and the value also flows to the global variables, which in turn global flows to something and global others. So it's, it's, uh, the, the data flow is complicated, but this part you can just observe that uh, once this value is read, the value of a100 is is equal to A0 plus 100. And that invariant or that fact holds for all possible interleaving. So it holds all for, for this interleaving as well as this interleaving and other interleavings that you could think of. Okay. So, but the problem is that there are exponential number of interleavings. And a, a standard analyzer would actually recompute this fact for over and over for each interleaving. Okay. And that, that exponential number of uh, repeated computation and that that chokes the, the the solver all the all the explicit enumeration engine that you might have okay so people have known about this problem and one set of methods that people have proposed are to identify these transactions okay transactions uh, have many meanings but are the, essentially interference free regions okay and the regions which are not exposed to interference by other threads and so in that region, you can summarize. Or you can just compact these transitions uh, once for once and then reuse that compacted result for all possible interleaves. Okay? So, but uh, if you try to look for such regions in, in, this, in this thread, in this particular example, uh, you want to compute this local fact, the A100 equal to A, but it's difficult because each of these assignments is interleaved by or is interspersed by a global assignment. Okay? So, uh, there's, all you can compress is just this single statement. There's, there's no more, you, you, there are no statements that are, you know, are in an interference-free region that can be compressed together. But, but for example, 
example, your assertion, right? It doesn't depend on all these Zs, right? So you can uh, abstract the Zs away. So you are first, first it depends on the Z, you know, Z99. You are... Right. Right, so uh, you can make a more complicated example where, and so so let me just just come to a, a even worse. So here a hundred equals this is a completely local fact. Now suppose it, it can also depend on, okay. So there was one here plus one. Mm -hmm. Suppose it depends on x now. Okay. So now you know that a hundred equals mostly a zero plus hundred plus that particular value that is red at, at this location. So if you can compute that, you would still avoid exponential number of repeated computations. Okay? So that, that's what I'm try trying to. So uh, repeated intra-thread reasoning or computing the local facts, it, 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 they may not be just completely separate from the global interaction. They could be intertwined with the global interaction. And what you want to still do in presence of you know, concurrency that you want to compute the local facts just for once. Okay? And what I'm trying to essentially motivate is some kind of summarization technique that works, thread local summarization, that works in presence of concurrency also. Okay, And th this is a core problem which is a non-trivial problem to solve. And uh, I'll show you how, how we do it. Okay, So that was the first bottleneck. So, so if you have x here, you actually want to input invariance of the form a hundred equals a zero plus hundred plus one plus something. x prime plus one x prime, where x prime is defined as the value that's read at program location. That is exactly how it will look like. Yeah. And that gives, uh, you're almost there, and th the basic idea would be clear in like two slides. Okay, so the second problem is scheduler. A scheduler is omnipresent in all kinds of concurrency analysis. So in explicit state verification, you have a you know explicit variable, or, and in symbolic uh, execution, you have a like a, scheduler variable which iterates over all the thread IDs and depending on the thread ID you pick the transition relation of the higher thread. Okay, so it's pretty omnipresent but the problem is that it doesn't model data flow directly. It's an indirect way of, of arguing about creating a data flow. Okay, so for example, this, this you can see that there's a null pointer dereference here. Okay, uh, if this value flows here and this value flows here. Okay, but to create that, uh, so it's simpler to view it as a data flow th thing, but to create that, scheduler has to you know, execute this statement, then possibly switch here, execute this statement, and possibly switch here. So it creates it, but in an indirect way. And I mean, every data flow fact you can create by switching the scheduler so in, in multiple ways. Okay? So, so if you extend this, this, uh, you know, this drawback, if you try to visualize it in a bigger scheme, the history of you know, concrete program analysis has relied on, on two main formalism for composing program. First, the, the one that I just talked about, the scheduler based, is called interleaved execution, where you context switch between multiple threads. Okay? The other one is, is based on partial ordered uh, traces, where you don't look for totally ordered traces, you just order the dependent or the read write events on, on the same variable kind of that okay so but both of these formulas for composing composing concrete programs are control centric okay so they what i mean by control centric is that the control flow induces the data flow okay so you can somehow create the control flow so that the you want the you get the desired data flow as opposed to the control centric paradigms the the the, the, the recent works have focused on this memory consistency based uh, model. What this paradigm allows you to do is, is to focus directly on the data flow. Okay? So you think in terms of reads and writes. And uh, th these, these models essentially tell you the rules for which, under which a particular read may observe a particular write for, to get a feasible execution. So it specifies rules on, on a given a set of reads and writes from the program, how, which, which write a read is supposed to observe to get a feasible execution. So what happens here is that the data flow induces the control flow. What I mean by that is that a read, when it observes a write, the write must happen before it. So you get a causal order. And also enforces the fact that no other write happens in between. So those writes should happen before. So th that's how the data flow, you focus directly on the data flow and get the control flow back.
Okay, so this is a data centric notion of of of, of uh, composition, if you want, and uh, it has been mostly focused. The recent works are mostly focused on low level relaxed models, mostly. Uh, so our goal in this work was to bring it back to high level static analysis, and instead of using a scheduler which is omnipresent in high level static analysis, use this memory consistency axis. Okay, so uh, so those are the two main drawbacks and uh, the, f the first problem, you'll see summarization, how to compute thread local summarization and, and how, how to use these memory consistency models to actually uh, compose programs. Okay, so before I go on to the exact solutions, uh, the background setting, concurrent program verification is undecidable in general. Uh, people have uh, used uh, schemes like context bounding to make it decidable, uh, that's one particular way. So our goal was to analyze, you know, uh, real programs with integers and uh, possibly infinite data structures, and so we we and under unbounded context, we didn't want to impose that particular restriction. So we came up with a different uh, restriction, essentially structural bounding. Uh, you you take arbitrary program, concurrent program, say C programs with P threads, and you unroll those programs up to a finite bound, and that. Or you get a structurally bounded program, okay? And using that program, you analyze essentially that program. Okay, what this structural bounding lets you, uh, helps you with is that uh, with, with bounded number of loops or recursion, you get bounded number of threads, bounded heap creation, and, and if the, the underlying theory is decidable, then you get a decidable problem, verification problem. So this is just a, a theoretical restriction that we, we started out with. That, uh, to me, this is a fundamental game-changing assumption. Like, I don't yeah. think you can compare this to other static or dynamic techniques. If you put in the bounding, it's like, okay, you're now in a category of your own. You're in the category of bounded model checking. Yes. I'm not saying it's invalid, but I think it's very dangerous to compare your work to work that is designed for a different problem state. Sure. Uh, to which work are you referring to, Sebastian? Uh, so, so anytime you, you create a test, that has only a finite number of executions. And then you say, okay, I have a technique that can you know, completely verify this test. It's not the same as doing model checking or doing static analysis in a classical setting. Right? Yes, you do not make that limiting assumption. Yes, so this is static analysis of bounded programs. If that is fundamental restriction, I'll, I don't have problems admitting it. The thing is that it's still a pragmatic decision. I would like to argue that because you could take an arbitrary code base and you know bound different functions to different depths, and we have observed in practice that many of the bugs appear under small bounds. Yeah, I don't so, disagree with that. That's what we're doing too. Yeah, just saying it needs to be. It's a very so essentially I'm I'm avoiding fixed points, computing fixed points. The rest of the you know rest of the machinery is there, but I'm I'm trying to avoid. I don't know of a way to compute fixed points. If, if this work has to be generalized, that, that is the missing part. But otherwise, uh, it's, it's extremely similar to what a traditional static analysis would do, or programs would do. And maybe when I show some examples, maybe, but yeah, that restriction is there. So there are some simple examples that will throw, I mean, you know, throw this kind of bounding away, right? So this is not restriction in your setting, but I just wanted to see whether you have seen this problem in practice. For example, if I have a loop that goes and initializes all elements in an array, array might be pretty large but still bounded. And yeah. so, you know, you might want to unroll that loop alone a million right. times. So, so if you know the upper bound, then you'll see the way the analysis, so you don't need to fix the static bound before you start the analysis. The analysis can dynamically fix the bound, okay? So if the particular array bound, if you know the number 100, the analysis can use that fact to actually unroll it 100 times based on, because it's data flow analysis based. You can compute these loop exiting values. I'm bringing in some more stuff, but the, the, so there, there, are some, there is some freedom. You don't fix the bound and just analyze it as perhaps was done traditionally. You can dynamically change the bound, decide the bound on the fly. But overall, it remains a bounded line. The, the fixed point computation is not there. So the, that's what I point, fixed point computation is not there, otherwise, Almost everything is there. So I have a question for you. So the, you said that you don't want to bound the number of context you choose. Yes. Right? You just want to bound 
the sort of the depth of the program. And is there any particular reason for it? So ideally, if you're in the game of bug hunting, right? right? You want to find bugs doing as little work as possible, right? That's true. So do you really, do, do you, so in general, I'm sort of trying to ask you about a philosophical question. Are you really trying to open the door in research towards all kinds of bounding strategies? As um, long as they're able to find valuable bugs. I'm quickly. trying to shift essentially from control centric to data centric, okay? So context bounding is a, is a, abstraction, notion of abstraction that is associated with a control centric model, a scheduler based model. Okay, if you switch to the data centric model, this read and write based, the notion of abstraction will become, is a different notion, which I'll talk briefly at the end. Mm -hmm. Okay, so but, but I'm, I'm like starting out again, that's why it looks like I'm, I'm analyzing it on all bounds, but there's a, there's an analogy of, of context bounding in this domain, mm -hmm. which we did interference abstraction, you probably saw that. Yeah, so there you can essentially what you do by context bounding in a, uh, by with a scheduler, you can simulate it by, you know, fixing the reads and writes to how, how they are linked. Ah, I see. So you sim, so these two models are just duals in different domains, and what you can do here probably you can do here also. Mm -hmm. So I'm just starting out in the data centric domain. That's why I'm starting right. from scratch. But yeah, you you want to have some, some abstractions which will help you find bugs better. So, so but I still I have another question. So you, you have this data centric model. You are going to define whatever you're going to do with the data centric model on bounded programs. Is that very fundamental? Could you have, uh, is it, can you define whatever it is that you are doing even on unbounded programs? Um, or is that the starting point? I think point? it is fundamental. Yeah, I think that's why I brought it up. I, I see. The way, the way the analysis is designed. Requires that you know exactly. Again, the gap is how do you compute fixed points when you're just working on reads and writes? Uh, you, I, I don't know of good ways to do it. They're simple, you can set up data flow equations and, and solve them, that kind of thing. Okay, all right. So, so one thing that I just, uh, I think the difference between unrolling loops and context bounding is that uh, when you unroll loops, you can actually, as you run with a certain, you know, unrolling, you can detect that your unrolling was sufficient, and then you're actually done. Right. And then that you, Correct. You are, you're sure that you have to export everything. Correct. That doesn't work with context. Correct. Okay, so, yeah, so again, uh, our focus is on finding bugs, witnesses. Okay, so, again, I'm, I'm in the preliminary section. Uh, so, you represent the program as concurrent control flow graph. Uh, the, the, it has forks and joins, so our analysis directly handles forks and joins. And uh, the, the thing is that everything is reduced to shared variables. So all the lock primitives uh, and the weight notifier exam are, are, are modeled as shared variables, okay? So simple lock is modeled as assume guarded assignment, essentially. And this is supposed to be atomic. So we assume that there, there could be atomic regions in that CCFG. Uh, and similarly, unlock. TID is the thread ID, current thread ID. Yeah. No, you can deadlock. Deadlocks just correspond to you know two points whose path conditions, reachability con conditions are 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 false. They can't, cannot be reached together. Am I am I missing that? Yeah, that's miss. But uh, uh, okay, what is deadlock? Um, you 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 can't progress beyond that point, right? So if you if you check that thing for for the the next two locations and the path conditions for the next two locations, I think you can detect deadlocks. Yeah, but I yeah I never considered it a restriction. And this is you you'll get all the lo locking uh, uh, property mutual exclusion by by this modeling. Yeah. They, they are not I lost at all. That. Okay. But yeah, I, I don't think deadlock is a problem at all. Okay, so and any analysis has to assume a memory representation. So we what we do essentially is take the heap, partition into several parts based on a flow insensitive point analysis. This is a very, uh, you know, basic modeling and we didn't focus at all on this part. This is just to make the whole machinery go through. And, uh, you know, if there's a pointer star p equal to l kind of statement. So we have this global heap and, and local heaps for each thread. And memg is the global heap, and is this statement is translated into an array access into the memg heap. That's quite standard modeling. 
And so, so all the program statements are either in terms of memg or meml. Okay? And uh, you can, the, the analysis will compute you know, path condition based on these arrays. Okay, okay so an example, uh, this is a pthread based C program. It creates two threads, t1, t2, each of which execute at global function. Okay, and each of the at global functions has this uh, basically has, uh, has this uh, accesses on the sh uh, shared variable x, and this is how the concurrent control flow graph looks uh, for that example. Uh, you have a fork creation of two threads, uh, assignments, assign, uh, guards, assignment, okay, and then this join, and this particular assertion is modeled in the standard way as an error location, whose Incoming guard is x not equal to three. Okay, so this is standard graph just with forks and joins. Okay. Okay. So now coming to the solutions. The first problem was how to avoid repeated intra-thread reasoning. As I motivated, you need some kind of summarization scheme. So now summarization is well studied for sequential programs. What's the catch with concurrent programs? Why is it difficult? So if you look at this particular function, this is a simple example. Uh, this function and the x is a global variable uh, based on it does these. So its summary, uh, a precise summary of this function would look like the return value is equal to the input value of a to this function plus one, okay? Now this summary only holds in a sequential context. And the nice thing about summaries is that you can reuse them for all calling context of these functions. But what if there's a function executing in parallel which writes to x? So now what happens, you would somehow want this summary to be reused to work in that, in the concurrent context. But, but it, it's almost impossible because, you know, this, this read of shared variable may either get this value or that value. Okay, and so now it starts depending on all possible contexts and either you can over approximate all possible contexts or lose some precision. Okay, so this, this is not fitting into our, our sense of our traditional notion of of nice summaries, so-called nice summaries or local summaries. Okay, so how do we change our summaries or redefine the way we compute summaries or the summaries to, to fit in this context? Okay, so the key problem that you notice is that in this local, con uh, local sum or sequential summarization, the read here is automatically associated, is kind of coupled with the previous write. And that doesn't work in the concurrent context. So we just break that, that fundamental restriction. Okay, and that's what we call interference abstraction. Okay, so the read may, in a concurrent context, the read may not couple with the last write. Okay, so our go, our, the key idea of getting over it is to decouple the reads of writes. How do you decouple it? Okay, so you have these these two threads. It's almost the same example, and here there's a read which can couple with either of them. You decouple it in a very simple way by just introducing a new symbolic placeholder for it uh, instead of the, the value x being read, you, you put a new symbolic value rx. Now this rx kind of models all the possible interferences that this, this particular read can get from all, all the other points. So kind of you have delayed the, the inter possible interferences at this point, and you'll have to take into account the interferences at, at a later point, but right now you have kind of decoupled this particular read from all possible writes. And what that allows you is to essentially propagate this value rx all the way down into the thread. Okay, it can flow into other uh, local variables, to other global variables, and so on. And this essentially allows you to compute these thread local summaries. So this, this simple and key idea will essentially build up this whole staged analysis framework. Yeah. In your previous example, Rx would also be a logical input to the function. So, so you have to, you're talking about the notion of summary, which will become clear in, in one more. It's actually a graph now. It's, it's yeah. Okay, so now I can introduce the whole framework. The first step is what I call interference modular summarization. Essentially, you introduce the symbolic placeholders and do a data flow analysis locally, okay? The next step, you have these reads and writes on global axes. That, that's what left as a summary. I haven't defined the summary yet, but that's how it looks like. It's reads and writes captured from each of the threads. And to get these actual feasible execution, you have to link these reads and writes correctly. And how do you do it? Obvious idea, use memory consistency axioms. 
in particularly we will use sequential consistency acts. Finally, you check properties uh, that, that is done using uh, decision procedure, SMT solver. Okay. So, what this allows you is first step you do only do intra thread reasoning, next step you only do inter thread reasoning. So, you have not only avoided uh, repeated, inter, uh, repeated local reasoning, but you have also decoupled uh, the local and the global uh, intra, intra and inter thread reasoning. Okay, and finally, you check property. Okay, so yeah. So, I have a question. By, so, I mean, you call them stages, but they're really just like three, a conjunction of three formulas, and then you solve. Yes. So, but you, the, 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 why I call, for example, the first stage because in the first stage you can use. Uh, can you go back to the stages? So this this stage only does look. So you're right. It's just a conjunction of three formulas, but uh, each of those formulas is, is computed by a very different kind of analysis. Yeah. And but I think you should maybe not say it's stages because stages implies that you need the results from the previous stage to compute the next stage. Right. So the. Well, you don't need the results from the previous stage uh, to compute. Can they happen in parallel? I. Uh, actually, that's the the second phase also depends on the first phase. Unless you have the summary computed, how would you, you know, link them? Well, I so I, I built a tool like this. Yes, and, yes. Um, I did those three things independently. They're just three formulas. Yes, but but the thing is that if you do the first step, the summarization, that improves the second stage, or that kind of improves the final. What is the information from the first stage that you need in the second stage? Just the, you get rid of all the local stuff, only the global, global reads and writes. Okay. And so the analysis of what is local versus what is shared, I grant you that. That's something you want to do before you start things. Uh, so that analysis is effectively summarized. I think I should get to so the example we, and then it would be. move to the example because okay. I yeah. still don't understand each of the. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'm talking too much and not showing the example. Okay. Okay. So okay. overall what you'll see is, is this data flow analysis. So the first stage, essentially, you can reuse, well, basically reuse the sequential uh, summarization machinery to uh, compute summaries for in concurrent content. And that you'll do in a standard data flow analysis style, modulo these symbolic placeholders. Okay. I'm going to analyze this example. Or just the left part of it, actually. That's good enough for a slide. Okay. Okay. So so. So there are a number of different or new things that you might see or might not see. So I'll have to just go over everything step by step. So the data flow domain that we are going to propagate is a path condition uh, memory tuple. Okay. So, um, so you said you're going to do this one thread at a time. Actually, I'm going to do it for the whole unbounded program just once without interleaving, considering any interleaving. Will you also be looking at each function exactly once? That's what yes. traditional uh, signature yes. So I'll, I'll compute the summary for each function and then reuse it for each each other context. The traditional summary is, is very, the original RHS thing is very lightweight. This will be more complex. I mean, it's reused. You might not feel like it's being reused, but still it will be, there is a notion of reuse here. Okay. So, okay. So, there's a right here. So this part, I'll, I'll build the summary, okay, the, the, or the principal component of the summary for, the, for this region. Okay. And there's a graph coming up here. Okay. And how I compute the graph, I'll show. Uh, so there's a global right here. Each right, so sequential analysis, each transformer updates this data flow fact here locally. Okay. The difference here is that all the local statements will affect the, this fact being propagated. But the global statements are not going to affect this, this propagated fact. They're going to be recorded separately. Okay? And it will be clear why that is done. Okay? So uh, you do this right. Uh, how do you model this right? The location of it, address of x, the value 0, and the condition under which it occurs, the path condition under which this is executed, which is true. Okay? Now you propagate the same fact here. This m0 is the memory, uh, that local heap for the main thread. True is the path condition. 
So the, the condition under which it's like symbolic execution happening, and I'll finally con like merge the data facts at the join nodes. That's what is going to happen, but in a slightly different way. Okay, so this is a fork node. This is the main thread. This is a child thread. For the child thread, I create a new memory location, a new memory uh, heap. Okay, M1, and okay. So now there's a global read location. This is where I record all possible interferences, all possible values that you can read by, by having a symbolic value, R1. The condition that this occurs is still true. The condition that this read happens is still true. Okay. So now I use this fact in, in the local flow. So based on this, this particular R1 value read, this guard is evaluated, it changes the path condition, you propagate the memory as it is. Okay. There's another read happening, another symbolic placeholder. Now the condition under which this particular read may happen is actually R1 less than 1, which depends on the previously read value. Okay, so all that is precisely being captured as I, and I'm going to, you'll see that the local, local facts are all removed. Local control and data flow is all removed. And in parallel, I'm building this graph, this causal order graph, which just records the order in which the writes and reads happen. This is essential for the later phase where you want to consider kind of all interleavings of it. So that's what I said in the beginning. It's a flow insensitive point analysis. The amount of detail it provides is, you can do much better than that, but that's how. It's actually, this analysis is not going to infer that. It's no, it's not. It's going. Yeah, point. yeah. So this analysis, basically you could think that it, it takes in as input all kinds of point analysis, MHP, you know, all kinds of static analysis that you can do for the whole lightweight study. This is a very precise analysis and it has scalability problems. And all. So, okay, next step, uh, now you update this temporary variable, local variable, okay, so that, that's a heap update. And note that this heap update exactly captures the value that was read here, which is R2, okay. You'll fix these values of R2s and R1 later on, but right now it's, it's still, uh, it's, it's kind of uh, oblivious yet taken to the fact that some value is read. Okay, another write uh, that now, okay, this doesn't affect this. You, you, you add a new uh, write uh, event, which is, has the value R2 plus one, okay. Okay, so you continue with doing that, and at the join node here, this is the intra-thread join. You disjoin the path condition, get true, and you compute a merge of the facts uh, for the local axis. So it's done by an if-then-else operator based on the path condition. If this holds, then the value of temp is R2, otherwise R3. Yes. Theorem prover understands Boolean logic. Yes, so it understands. Because I, uh, so how? So okay, how would you use a theorem prover otherwise? I mean, you just encode all. You can. I mean, I'm sure there's a way to encode all possible paths. So this is an efficient way of encoding all possible paths. So you are actually not losing any information. No. Oh, when you, I, I automatically assume when you said join that you're losing information. No, I no, guess no, you're no. not. So, yeah, I, I forgot to stress that. that The whole analysis is extremely precise. Okay, Even okay. though I'm summarizing, there's no information. Okay, left. okay, got it. Yeah. So I think of this as what, you know, I would call VC generation. This is VC like generation that. happening in an abstract auditor flow analysis type. I see, okay. And right. that, that's what I've been doing for the, like, even in the, Initial refinement, but that's what the basis of. And then I think the only difference is that you care about the reads and writes to potentially share variables, mm -hmm. and you need to maintain them as a reference point to link this to the Correct. interference point. That's the like more extra complication compared to basic generation of sequential yeah. programs. Yeah. So even if this wasn't there, you could have a basic sequential uh, analysis mechanism based on. Sequential analysis, a read would always be, you know, we could always determine that very complex value for you, you propagate the previous. Oh, I still have more questions. Should I ask them? I will wait, wait, wait. Let, okay. me, uh, let, let him do the example. Okay. Uh, this okay. example and another one at the end, please. Okay. Patience. <laughs> so you'll. Okay, so I missed something, but should I go to it's, it's fine. Okay, so finally you get this R4 for, for this path condition. Okay. And. Uh, the error path conditions are R4 not equal to 3. So what you'll be checking essentially is, is whether this, this is satisfied, R4 not equal to 3 is satisfied for some program interleaving or for, for some feasible execution, okay? 
So this, this thing that you compute here is the summary of this region. Okay? Actually, this is not the full summary, but this is the main component of the summary, which tells you how the reads and writes are ordered, and each of the nodes here corresponds to an entry in the table. Okay? So if you want to encode it as a formula, which I, I would do later on, what you'll do is use three uninterpreted functions, the, the location, the value, and the occurrence condition. And based on these, these three things and a happens before predicate, you'll be able to encode this. Okay? So essentially what this captures, it gets rid of all the local flow and the lo local control and the data flow. It's, it's, and what remains is just the happens before, the order of reads and writes. And all the local information is kind of transferred to these global accesses. These reads and writes contain all the information that was there in, the, in terms of the local flow. And so this is sufficient to go over to the next stage. And we only, essentially for global analysis or inter-thread reasoning, you only need this graph. You don't need the local parts at all. You, I mean, essentially, you want to avoid it because you'll be recomputing re that local facts over and over again. Okay. So, I mean, I just analyzed the left part of the graph. The whole thing looks, what this is the summary for this whole program, and I call it interference skeleton. Okay. And note that this has folk joins, and this could be inside a particular function. Okay, this whole thing could be inside one particular function. And so you would be summarizing a function in terms of this, this graph as well as the output-input relation. Okay, so this, this is a heavy, kind of heavy summary which can still be reused because I, I won't be computing the local facts over and over again. If this function made a function call, what would you do? That, that function, uh, that would be inlined. The summary, summary would be inline, not the function, but so, so the standard way in which you compute, uh, yeah, a, a, a bottom-up analysis. Uh, you, you, you go down, you compute the summary of the function, and you reuse it to compute facts in the top-level function. Summary of the top-level function depends on the summary of the lower function. So it has to be brought in to compute the summary of the. So I guess my question really is that in your FM CAD paper, right? The inertial refinement paper. Yes. The beautiful thing about that paper was that the cost of aligning did not have to be paid eagerly. Yes. So this is an eager now, eager so analysis. Here you, here you don't have that beautiful property. I don't have. I haven't added structural abstraction yet to this okay. scheme. You can add a structural abstraction that uh, uh, that allows you to lazily bring in these summaries. So you could still compute these graphs later initially, but you could. Uh, these graphs would have kind of placeholders corresponding to function calls. And they, these that seems a little challenging to me, right? Because you're doing the stage business, right? So your second part of the stage requires all this crap to be inlined up front. Right? Yeah, but you can add more crap to it as you expand. <laughs> can you can you add more crap that, that has shared memory accesses? That yes, yes, you can add. I mean that, that would make a big difference to me. In terms so, uh, yeah, I, I'm talking about something that I haven't written in the paper, okay. but I, I think it's, it's quite feasible. And okay. Okay, do that then. <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay, so uh, th this is how the, the summary looks like, essentially path condition, the memory, and the interference skeleton. Okay. And the memory means that the output memory in terms of the input memory of a particular function. Path condition is a set of paths that have been analyzed through the function. Okay. And this can be reused. So the path condition memory part was, was common to my previous work also, in Ashley, where I was reusing these two. But here, the in interference skeleton is the new thing. Okay, and now you can define the standard operators in the RHS style. It's all heavyweight because it's very precise. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just skip this. But the, you define the standard join and, and how do you introduce this uh, global and read and write access. Okay, so I think I have motivated the notion of summary. That's how summary essentially looks like a graph, consists of read and write accesses and their order. Okay, and now you have this, this interference skeleton, which is the summary. Now you have to link these reads and writes properly to get feasible execution. Uh, an arbitrary interleaving of these reads and writes may not correspond to feasible execution because uh, you know, they have guards associated with it, they have values associated with it. So how do you properly link them is given by memory consistency axiom. In particular, I'll be working with sequential consistency X. Okay? So, what sequential... So, before we go, uh, can you go back two slides? Yeah, so, 
the way I read that uh, triple is that um, given uh, so this is a this is a summary of a function. Yes. And the function can create on an joints. arbitrary program region. Know, it's an actually an arbitrary program region which can have folks and joints also. Can have folks but and but joints. bounded program. That's the hey, first that's restriction the first I put in here. Okay. And um, so where is the input is actually part of the memory. So memory, so you actually so, have both, you need both input memory and output memory. So when you start analyzing a function, mm -hmm. you just assume a thread local memory for it. Okay. okay. And and then you propagate that memory. And what you get is the output memory. And that depends on some symbolic variables, much like symbolic execution. So you don't need to assign symbolic variables for each each variable. You can just have like one array, and wherever it's updated, it's lazily updated by. So, so in the sense, I should think of a summary as a as a relation between a triple and input triple to an output triple, or a function. Actually, I view it as a function as a rel function preserves some more information. Okay. Yeah. And so, what is the the input in the input uh, triple? What does the interference skeleton refer to? So I can see what the interference skeleton refers to in the output. Like, you know, no, that's the no, no, no. So, so, by all the reads. So, the, no. so the, the, if you forget about the interference skeleton part, this is the same as sequential case. Okay. okay. So this doesn't refer to the interference skeleton at all. The first okay. two parts. So what does the input interference skeleton mean? How do I think? Of so there's no input. Sorry, there's no input or output interference skeleton. The input output data facts are only captured here in the memory part. Okay. The out the transform the, the interference skeleton is just, also depends on the initial memory, but it's just a graph which which is standalone graph. Okay. It, With different inputs, you will get different it, interference yeah, skeleton. Yeah, so when you have to reuse it, you'll have to instantiate the the reads and writes which have these placeholders on the initial input with with the new. So you have to do a substitution operation. The whole graph will essentially remain this. Okay, so. Coming to the second phase, how do you link these reads? In it? Use with the sequential consistency axiom, much similar to what you know. And these axioms essentially say that informally there are two rules. Each read must link with some write. You have a set of reads and writes in the program. Each link must use some write. And if a read links with some write, then no other conflicting write should happen in between. No other write to the same memory location should happen in between. Okay? So there are the basic two informal rules. You have to model it as formula to you know, fit in the whole uh, framework. So how do you model them effectively? Uh, you, you, you assign these types to these reads and write access, or just think of them as separate entities, not integers or whatever. Okay? And then you define two main predicates, the link predicate and the must happens before relation. Okay? The link predicate is like the observer relation. If a, a read links with write, then uh, the read obtains its value from that write in, in some execution. Okay. And it has this also property that it's exclusive. Read can only obtain its value from one write. The, happens, the must happens before is the causal order. Okay. And this is a strict partial order. And based on these two things, we'll, we'll see how the axioms are modeled. So they consist of three parts. Uh, I may, okay, so the first was each read must link some write. For all reads, if it is enabled, or read is enabled if and only if, it links with a enabled write. Okay? So this occurs predicate I have to add because I'm working on, on branches, on, on programs, and not simple trace. So no. yeah. And then there's a local consistency. If a read links with some write, then the location of the read and write should be same. The value of, of them should be same. And write must happen before. Function. That was a mistake that I did, uh, you know, since the beginning. So it, it can be just modeled as a function. Yeah. So, and uh, but uh, but uh, I'm, it's more of a presentation mistake. The implementation I did was was I'll show on the next slide. Actually, you can optimize this. Yeah, by assigning IDs. Yeah, you'll see on the next. Slide. Yeah, but I I didn't realize that you could make it simple. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you can. Yeah, you need to introduce the number of writes equal to number of reads uh, that you can optimize. All the reads you need at most those initial writes equal to number of reads. 
that you're going to see in the interference skillet. That is one option. Right, right on teacher's model as a partial function. So you think it's already a relation, you don't require, you know. You can say you don't have to link, it can also be not linked, and in that case, you just get the default value. Yeah, but it's, yeah, it's that all might be an optimization. I have to, yeah, it, it may work. I, I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay, so uh, this is the local consistency, this is global consistency. Essentially, it says that if a read links with some write, then no other W prime can happen in between. It's just a complicated way of saying it. If no other write is enabled and happens in between, this is written in terms of HB also. And, or, well, this reads like, if another write happens in between, then it should write to some other location, not to this particular. Okay, based on, the, so these are quantified first order logic formulas. Okay, and uh, if you give them to a solver directly, we use DIX, we haven't tried Z3. So, uh, yikes didn't scale for even small example. Okay, they don't have a like efficient instantiation strategy for uh, at least for bounded. These are bounded instantiation. Okay. So you were using the, you were not instantiating it outside the prover. You were you tried to instantiate them inside the prover. Yeah, yeah. I'm just introducing that we tried that also, and therefore the automatic strategy was to instantiate them explicitly. Okay. Okay. So yeah. So. So what is the cost of, so, so uh, what is the, uh, so directly putting them, even the solvers supported, directly putting them didn't work. So we, we separately instantiated them, and so at most there could be a cubic number of instantiation. Again, this cubic is in previous formulation, it's actually quadratic if you have that function. But how, what does this instantiation look like? So you have this interference skeleton, you have the reads and writes, okay, there's capital here, right, and small here, but they are basically the same. Okay, so what this says pi one is that if R two is enabled, this R two is enabled, then it must link with either W one or W two prime, and so on. Okay, so note that this captured all the information about the program flow, and now when you are linking this, you are trying to remove the decoupling. You are trying to bring back the actual facts, actual interference, and consider all the possible interferences. So this disjunction essentially captured all the possible interferences that may happen to R two. From double. You are explicitly avoiding all rights that happen after a particular week. Is that what you do? No. Uh, uh, that is in Pi 3, actually. Uh, and you are probably talking about an optimization, which you, yeah, there's a separate phase of optimization where you have to do all that. Yes. Uh, but I'm just, I was just telling the basic what, what this means. Okay, so, and when you link R2 to W2 prime, you make sure that these two locations actually are the same. So they could be you know, pointers. And uh, the, the actual solver will check if only if they are same, then it will allow you to link them. The values are same. So the, this symbolic placeholder that you put in earlier is now actually assigned a value based on the right value. Okay? And the causal order is, is, is inferred. And third one is the most complex one. You, you don't want any, in the causal order, you don't want any other right to happen in between. So you make sure you instantiate them for all. So there, there are clear there are many equivalent ways of encoding. Yes. So I also use the cubic encoding in check fence, but, but I know that uh, researchers at MEC have shown that you can do it with less than cubic encoding. Yeah. So I'm curious as to... The formula size is... So I, I, the link acts is, is essentially a function. And that, that's the mistake I did. I didn't observe it. So if you put it as observer function, like, uh, you you can have a reformulation of it, which which is just correct. So the I don't think it's trivial. I mean, what I'm saying is there is no trivial research that they did, in, like techniques about this token passing. That I so read. I think they are unrelated. The, the, the but they end up with you know, it's a better encoding that is not cubic. Cool. So, so how can you say <laughs> it's Malay, Malay, Malay so. and, and RTS? And yes. Good. Yes. Uh, the, the, there are a number of things there, but if you just argue about the cubic and the quadratic part, they can be obtained in this encoding as well as that encoding. There you have the token and you, you work on total order, and so you can do some more optimizations. You know, that, that is particular to that work. I, I don't, to me, I'm very surprised that you, you, you know, present this as a separate work. It seems the same to me. Okay, the differences uh, there could be that that particular uh, op, uh, encoding works on total orders. Okay. Total order means that the token actually is passed from one thread to another. It's, it's, 
it's kind of yeah, symbol. It's a lot, but it's not explicit and encoded as a total no. order. No, no, it's not. Both of them are symbolic. Yeah. Whereas this, I'll show with an example. This works on partial orders directly. Yeah. So that token is kind of uh, might help you get some for optimization or leverage on the problem. But just for you know anal analysis, it's not necessary. You could work directly on partial order. Maybe yeah, I'll come to it. See, it's all about total orders and partial orders. So clearly, SC is defined over total orders. And then the question on how much so, of the total order the solver so actually has to construct to find that thing, you know, it's not, it's not clear from the outside. Yeah, so uh, although it has been, it was you know, formally defined using total order and you know, paper, you can, you know, yeah, this is formal, but you, even, you can just uh, encode SC axioms using partial orders. Mm -hmm. You don't need total orders. The essential part is pi 3. Pi 3 is what forces, uh, the, the thing that I said earlier, data flow enforces control flow. So, well, you don't need, the thing right. is that if, if a read links with some write, mm -hmm. then all the other writes would be forced to happen before or after. So that, I, that is sufficient for ordering, getting the requisite order for a problem. You, do, you don't need any more ordering. Sure, there. sure, I mean, but I think the question is, is not can you or can you not, the question is, if you have all these different ways of encoding this, which one will actually work better in practice? I, I yes. So, so, okay. So, so, so in that question, we haven't, we haven't done a, a proper comparison between you those can two. Play logical games, and one of these encodings may look better than the other based on the size. You can say this is cubic, the other one is quadratic. You can say <laughs> this is total order, this is partial order. But what does it tell me? I mean, it tells me nothing about which sure. order I should actually use. Sure, sure. So, so our, our experimental comparison between those two is yet to be done. We haven't done. But there, there. Are, other reasons also, I mean, there are more optimizations than, you know, mad based encoding, which we have to incorporate to make a fair comparison. Yeah, but, and, and my, I wasn't trying to stress that this is the best encoding possible. I was just trying to present yeah, this whole framework. I, I would just be very interested because sure. I have my own encoding, then I have a about their encoding, and you still show another encoding. So at this point, I would like to sort of make a comparison. It sort of begs for a comparison. Sure. sure. And there is another twist that, our follow-up paper did, which is independent of the number of axioms you have in the beginning, which is a notion of abstraction associated with, mm -hmm. uh, which is not dependent on QB or quadratic. Right. And I think that is the key issue as opposed to you know, QB. Okay. So yeah, I'll talk about it in the end. But okay. So, so in practice, how many variables do you have? The number of uh, reads and writes are, uh, I oh. count the number of reads in thousands. Uh, yeah, this one is in thousands. The next one is probably 3,000, 4,000, but in thousands, yeah. No, no, so I, no, it's, it's not related to cubic. The next one was also cubic encoding. The, the, the game changing thing was different. This notion of abstraction, which is completely independent of cubic encoding. Do you try and do any kind of operations on the, to reduce the number of reads and writes? So when you actually inline, for instance, so if you do a spot pop pass and we inline, uh, the, the, the interference goal. You could actually, you, know, you could have a lot of redundant information on reads and writes. Uh, so we have a set of optimizations on the interference collector, which, which avoid this, you know, redundant instantiation of the axioms. Yeah. So th there's a there's a step optimization step, there, which is essentially a static analysis of the interest. Yeah. You, you you want to avoid any redundant instantiation of the axioms. So that is there. But that has been common to previous methods also. Sure. Now, can you answer Sebastian's previous question as to can you do the two stages in parallel? That is, can you, yeah. if so, you statically know what are, sta what are the uh, shared variables, yes. then you could actually. So the, oh, you need the happens before relations from the first stage. And the values also. Okay. Otherwise, what you will do, you'll take the original program, you'll encode it, and, and then you will. I mean, yeah, you, you'll, uh, you'll keep all the local information in there. I don't see a way of, of getting rid of local information if you did the parallel. So, I think Marlon has, so, so what you need is you need to know the accesses, you, need, you know, the nodes in your graph, and you need the program order. But you don't need anything of the rest yet. You can compose that later and you can chunk the formula. Yes. Um, so an alternate, maybe I tell the story in an alternate way. 
you can start instead of doing the summarization, you can do start with a SSA representation. I don't know how I'm doing on time, but I'm just talking here. Uh, you can go into uh, try to finish it by 11:45. I don't know what the time. 11:34. Um, so, so let me take that offline. Right? So, okay, but because that happens before graph might be a function of the local control flow. It is the function. So, yeah. the if you, so you have to compute it separately, and then the ha it's not the happens before graph. The, the, the first pass it does not do happens before that program order, right? Happens before is the combination of program order and sequential com consistency. Program order implies happens before. So I'm just taking everything as happens before this. There's a step there which I'm jumping through. But, yeah. yeah, okay, so you have to efficiently encode them. You use uninterpreted functions, and uh, this is the, you know, it's modeled as functions. I mean, all the, as, essentially you assign IDs to each of the and writes, and when there's a link, you, you copy the value. Okay, and the happens before, uh, essentially you, you assign timestamps to reads and writes through this clock function, and when you want to model this, you, you use the less than operator over integer theory. And there's a set of optimizations here, uh, which I call interference theory. Finally, the overview. Uh, yeah, you want to find bugs, for example, data races. Data races, a data race between read and write is just an unordered read and write. So you can model it as a formula here. Okay, uh, assertion violation, you take the corresponding path condition, which is this. Okay, and the full encoding, is so the encoding of the interference skeleton, the sequential consistency axiom, this was first stage, this was second stage, and the property, okay, visually. And you give it to an empty solver. If the solver comes up with solution, then we have a theorem that it actually corresponds to a feasible program trace, okay. If it doesn't, then we have a proof, but that proof just shows that the, there's no bug in the, un, in the bounded program, but that may not generalize to the unbounded program. Okay, so this is basically the, the whole thing. Um, First stage, you summarize, compute the skeleton, then link these reads and writes, and then check the property on it. And what's happening internally will be clear by an example, which I'm just going to skip. Essentially, pruning is that, okay, if a write happens before a read and you can statically infer that, then you don't instantiate that axiom, that this read can link that. Stuff like that, there's stuff for pi 1, pi 2, pi 3, and all that. Okay, so this example will probably clarify some things. So, this is the same uh, null pointer axis example that I showed. And this is the corresponding interference skeleton, okay. Uh, this is RC, RP, you can locate them. Okay, now the goal is to detect this null pointer axis violation. Uh, so to have a null pointer here, this RP must be enabled. So we look at the enabled condition. Uh, which is enabled RC and the value of RC is true. This is just making it more complicated. You can clearly figure out from, from this diagram. But So RP is enabled, implies RC is enabled, and the value of RC is true, these two facts. Okay. Now we start asserting the axioms. Okay. Because RP is enabled, so it has to be linked. Here there is only one option, WP. So it links with WP. And from pi to WP happens before RP. Okay, if something links, then WP, if RP links WP, then WP must happen before RP. Okay, and so when I had said this, I also drew an edge in this graph. So you had, you can view that you had an initial partial order, and slowly you are trying to make that partial order, refine that partial order by adding more and more causal order edges. Okay, okay? so that was pi 2. That was, that, that took care of RP. Okay, now we start with RC, the second read. Okay, read on, on C. So read C, this read can either link with this one or this one. Okay, so there are two options. That is what exactly pi 1 says. Okay, now try linking RC with WC1, RC with WC1. It's obvious here that if this false propagates here, this won't even execute. Well, that is what the solver infers. So val of RC equal to val of WC is equal to false. That is given by the pi 2. Okay, this contradicts with, you know, the previous fact that you had, that RC must be enabled. Okay, so, so this option is ruled out. You only have the second option. Uh, that enforces this particular order that WC2 happens before RC. Okay. And now you have to also check pi 3 for RC. So the thing is that in this partial, this partial order may not still be a, correspond to a feasible execution. 
there's a WC1 that could intrude in between w, uh, these two. Okay, so that you have to enforce that happens before. Okay, so once you have this partial ordered graph, then you can arbitrarily linearize it to get multiple feasible trees. So we, we searched over a partial ordered domain or defining the partial order, and then one could get to any linearization of it. And this space is, uh, yeah, um, kind of coarser than the totally ordered domain. Okay, what the implementation? Uh, so what we did was to use this fusion tool, which is again a collection of several dynamic static analysis, to uh, obtain program slices, uh, ha having uh, parts of the program, and just did our analysis on, on those slices. Okay, and compared, essentially our goal was to show that this summarization thing that we developed, how much effect it has. Okay, so these are some benchmarks. This is the indexer benchmark. Uh, these are some Java benchmarks. This is parameterized by the number of threads. Okay, now these are small examples and uh, uh, the scalability is still an issue and our next work addressed that. Uh, but we are doing precise reasoning. So it always has its limits. The okay, number of nodes in the graph, number of edges, number of reads, number of writes. So these are around 1,000 reads and you know, 2,000 writes. Uh, the next work you know, increased that, but it's basically in that range. And we had to work based on SSA uh, representation, which was in FSC 09, Chow and the rest of the group had. And that didn't have the summarization. Okay. This is with summarization. So you can see. Um, the, the unsat part goes through very quickly, so the results are mainly sat. Sat uh, part, the sat solver has to do more work, at least most, so most of these benchmarks. That's probably the part that might it, it depends on those benchmarks, but uh, you know, most of the time, if, if the, the lock and unlock would rule out a data race, then it finishes very quickly. The unsat part finishes very quickly. I don't think you can make any generalization like that. Sure, I mean, you might, yeah, but no generalization like that are possible. Uh, you have to believe me. Or, uh, okay, so, okay, so small, uh, for, for, sorry, what kind of, so these are all buggy benchmarks, so what kind of bugs did they have? Assertion, these assertion violations we put, put there, and this is the indexer benchmark from DPR, uh, Gordy Fry's DPR paper. And we took some slices from it. Yeah. 20 means how many uh, entries in the array are there? Something like that. This is the number of threads. Number of threads. threads. Yeah, so it has this thing, the hash collision happens only after number of threads. And you know the number of collisions determine you know, the complexity of the problem. Uh -huh. So right. So that's why it, it kind of grows exponentially here. And it also grows here, but you know. So what I'm trying to show here is that summarization actually helps you get an exponential speed up <laughs> in, in analysis. So the real core is inter-thread reasoning, but summarization itself is extremely useful. So, so um, if I try to compare this to you know my own results, uh, so it's usually a good metric for me is the number of accesses to shared memory. So reads is that what you're showing here? Are those accesses to uh, all reads or writes, or accesses that are actually going to shared memory? No, these are only. Uh, so the thing is that yeah, these are only shared. Only shared because I got rid of the, all the local stuff in the first step itself. Okay. So. I'm just looking at the interference skeleton and working. And you can scale this further. You have 2,000 reads and 4,000 reads. But uh, this is your encoding is cubic in this. It's cubic in the. So I'll, I'll come so to another experiment. It's like it's scalable and it's cubic. Okay, good. Okay, so let, I'll come to another experiment table where you'll see something new. Okay. So, but there's related work both on summarization and. Uh, uh, scheduler less encoding. Okay, so transaction based, uh, you probably worked on inferring transaction and then summarizing inside it. And there is recent work, again, context. Uh, the, the difference with interference abstraction is that you're doing a state abstraction here. You, so you're duplic you duplicating all the global variables at each context switch location. And some of the global variables may not be duplicated. May not, you may not need them because they are not affected between two contexts. So, what, so, what is the first paper doing? It's, it's, it captures the whole tradition of uh, you know, path compression based algorithms. So your spin based uh, you know, 
when spin model checker was made, I think there were a bunch of algorithms which could figure out, uh, okay, this, this part is only doing local transformations, so just compress it while, while doing state space exploration. So, and it has more tricky methods also, some semantic analysis. So that's partial order reduction. That is, no, that is just uh, compression. Uh, well, you could you could put it under you classify yeah, under it static person. Very simplest kind of part. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's yeah. very effective. No, most static partial order reductions have that kind of thing, right? To my knowledge. Yeah, that's true. Uh, just that it's uh, the slight difference could be that it's not done during the analysis. It could be done upfront. Yeah, so, and the I would say that there's again a history of such analysis. I would uh, probably. The Nemos framework, and there was a Java paper about Java, you know, memory model, and that could be considered the you know, starting point of this axiomatic model. Then your work, and then Malay and Arthi's work, and this was the previous work that Chow had. And there's also work in similar trend that Memsat work also for Java memory models. Yeah. So as far as scalability, the last one at the bottom is not scalable. So, so I asked them One minute, oh, one minute. Okay, so to summarize, this, this finishes this talk. I have four more slides, 11.45, but I'm not going to stop, okay? So, uh, uh, okay, the crux of it, avoid bimodal reasoning, summarize, and sequential constraint, data-centric. Okay, so scalability is the key issue. Okay, so, now, you had this notion of Mazukwe stays a partial order, and the context switch. So none of these formulas just work like that, okay? Both of them needed a notion of abstraction to actually scale. So what you have seen till now is just a very naive instantiation strategy. It essentially considers all the data flows. The instantiation of these axioms it, it basically means considering all the interleavings of, of these two programs, all the data flow configurations. I, they are actually data flow. And it's obviously extremely silly to do that. So you need an abstraction. Uh, the control centric abstractions are, are these are two well known controls. What what is the notion of abstraction here? So this our Popple paper answered this question for sequential constants. What you call a, a general set of interference abstractions. And how do you get these abstractions? Okay, uh, the, you can get them syntactically from the formula. Okay, uh, in a very kind of straightforward way. Uh, so there are these quantifiers there in the formula. Essentially, there are these ranges and these determine the complexity of the problem. Okay. And our goal is to have some kind of approximation of consider a limited set of data flow facts that will allow you to find the bugs or the proof. Okay. So one kind of approximation would be what if we don't link the reads, some of the reads at all, you know, just have them have the global value and, and done. So, this so, is very interesting, but isn't that what's happening in the solver anyway? So that's the thing. So when you throw the whole thing at the solver, it, it's not able to figure out. And that I'll show you by an experiment table. Okay. Yeah. And, and there are reasons because these these approximations, what we did was was use some concurrency uh, related domain information, like most bugs happen you know, under small schedules, or proofs you can find just by looking at the lock variables. So all these abstraction can. You can encode all that semantic information directly into this, this based yes. on this quantifier again. So, so if you just focus on some reads, you can you you'll get an over approximation behavior. You consider infeasible execution, but you might still get a proof. Okay, and similarly, you could consider, uh, read to be linked with a restricted set of writes, and there you'll get a under approximation, but that will help. So this is an analog of context bounding in the data centric domain. So, and how do you get them formally? You can restrict the bounds of these, these reads or instantiate these axioms only for a selected set of reads. And, and therefore, so this is a kind of property guided instantiation of axioms that helps this whole thing to scale. scale. Mm -hmm. The underlying idea being that if the property uh, only needs to consider data flow between small set of reads and writes, okay, or a restricted kind of data flow, then you can utilize that fact in, in while reasoning with this sequential consistency axiom and prove or find bugs faster. Yeah. So, but, uh, it's still not clear. So when I encoded, I encoded directly for SAT. And you know, it's very well known how SAT does the heuristics for figuring out, you know, to learn. But clearly it's not it's not obvious like if you use 
if you use this so, by calling how this so is quantify so you could ignore the quantifier for a while okay so the thing i was talking about locks is here okay in this example you can prove that there's absence of of uh, data rays between these two by ignoring all the x y z reads and writes you can just ignore them although they are in the interference skeleton you just ignore them only consider the locks the reads writes on locks and by just doing the sequential consistency reasoning on the locks you can prove that these these two can, cannot happen in parallel or cannot data rays okay uh, essentially the thing is that log log b and log b can either happen after this this log b and log b pair or before this log and log similarly log a and log a can happen either before this or well this can happen so, so you, you can and they, they could many other hundreds of shared variables lying in between we can just ignore and this can do systematic way by instantiating these act, these axioms in a selective manner only for the reads and writes initially okay so we have a you know abstraction refinement strategy you get a set of abstraction how do you figure out the you know most focused abstraction that will help you solve the problem uh, strategy with that and okay so this is the experiment results uh, so this is the full instantiation so, what uh, a summarization of the previous slide is that you sort of assume that there are no data races and so all variables are not of not shared you only need to consider the local the lock variables and then you refine them as you find data races based on that no yeah, that's not what you do. you you it's the other way around you assume that they're extremely shared I mean, you can, they can read arbitrary values, but those values that they read are not going to affect the fact that there is no data race. The proof of data race will not be affected by those values. So you, I just assign them random values and let the procedure. So the problem in, in the, the key problem reasoning is that the disjunction in pi one. So each read can link with several writes. The more things you add, the star solver has to touch more. So if you reduce that job somehow, which is what. So this is the full instantiation. It can get up to one million, which is bad. And with abstractions, you can get away with much smaller number of instantiations. And these are property guided instantiations. It is not quadratic or cubic. Given a property, figure out the smallest number of instantiations. So this, I believe, is going to scale even more. Yeah. Okay. okay. That concludes the thing. Okay. So please. At, at an abstract level, the, the technique you're doing that is different from these other encodings is that you're doing a lazy encoding. You give, you give the solver part, either giving only a part of the constraint or too many constraints, and then you, based on the outcome, you can adjust the formula. Yeah, the, the, the second part you're saying, right? You give it uh, more yeah, constraints, or so it's always less constraints, fewer. but but it it doesn't mean that it's a can go either way, under approximation or over. Yes. Fewer constraints doesn't correct. It just corresponds to a reduced data flow problem. A, yes, so, an so easier for the, problem. For the results you got here, you, you gave it fewer constraints? All of them are. This is just the count of, of number of constraints. So here I had up to 8 million constraints in Python. Yes, that's the following. And okay. here the corresponding is 20k. So fewer constraints were good enough, and that's why the solver could finish. Uh, right, that, right. That's, so, so that's not precisely that the reason because it had to do less, less data flow analysis to figure out whether there's proof. So it's not just the fewer constraints. You could give an arbitrary set of few constraints which were not useful. These constraints are specifically focused on, on making the solver quickly reason. Yeah, but yes, sure. But you haven't proved that there wouldn't be other ways to also give fewer constraints. I'm, I'm talking just general techniques. So all of these are unsat is, is what you're saying. No, no. Here there are pairs. Of uncertainty. So, so the generally the SAT here also takes more time. I think or maybe on one benchmark SAT and it's the other way around. But okay. um, yeah, yeah, this one is yeah other way around. This unsat takes more time okay. than SAT. But I think it's more. Uh, um, so, so all, all I'm trying to get at is sort of what, what's the difference to previous approaches, and the difference to me is that. You encode, you you interleaving the, the solver, having the solver you know work, and your work of encoding the program execution, so that you can sort of get feedback from the solver before you have to encode all the facts you know in the program. So that's, that's yeah, that's, that's, that summarizes it. Yeah, okay. but there's a semantic reason behind it. That what are the facts that you give? What are you doing essentially by giving it reduced number of constraints? 
you're making the solver focus on limited set of data flow facts, mm -hmm. limited set of reads and writes, which you think would be solver should focus on it first and will be able to succeed. Right. So right. that's the semantic reason, and that's you know, manifesting in terms of reduced number. Yes, yes. I think the big question is always, to me, my own experience was that it's not at all clear that me being smart about what I think the solver should start for working on is really better than heuristics in the solver. So I had experiences with um, color. There's a, there's a problem with giving too much, having to encode huge formulas. It's a big problem. So I'm, I'm not saying that's sure. that, that's a big advantage. But trying to be smart and say you should focus on the locks first. It's not always true. I mean, the, the solver can, the, the SAT solver can be pretty good at, at picking out, you know, good ways. So, to yeah, so that's why this table is there to show that well, it wasn't good. Okay. You give the whole thing. This is with the basic set of optimization. It's not just the you know, cubic, it's, it's optimized based on the you know, read rights, what read can actually statically observe the rights. Mm -hmm. It's not just the plain vanilla yes. cubic. Still, you know, you, you get these. And, and it, it, uh, the solver essentially doesn't finish. So, yeah. Whereas here, you know, solver finishes with. Solver essentially iteratively does lesser work, and that's why, and since the number of steps of iteration are, are small, that's why it finishes quickly. Mm -hmm. that's, the, the, the size of the instantiation is somewhat, you know, again, deluding. I mean, it's not directly connected to the cost of the thing. It's actually the number of iterations that it went through, and each iteration cost was small, because we forced it to focus on a small number of reads and writes. And that's why the whole thing finished. Yeah, OK, so.